this room is is particularly significant because we have the two most important people who are going to be really driving the global AI agenda. And we have developers and startups and researchers and all of you who are actually going to take a lot of the insights that we have today into action. So I'm really looking forward to diving into this very, very exciting conversation. And so I'd like to start with you. You know, with OpenAI obviously, you know, rapidly scaling and you know, a recent report says that it will contribute about 14% uh, to the global GDP by about 2030. Um, you know, you've obviously set the India AI mission charter out for what uh, our path will be or what India's path will be. I'm really curious to know uh, what do you feel are the two, three, you know, real opportunities that you want to focus on for the next five years? So listen, uh, our prime minister always says that we must democratize technology. So we are very much focused on democratizing technology, as in making technology accessible to everybody, as in making the development opportunities available to a very large number of startups and ecosystem researchers. Simultaneously, in our case, in the India A mission, we'll be working on all the three layers. At the chip design level, having our own GPU, at the foundational level, and we'll collaborate very actively with uh, OpenAI and at the application layer. Of course, we are creating certain very good data sets, which will be used for training uh, the models in uh, Indian context, in terms of its language, the cultural nuances, the regional, dif the regional nuances within the country, all that stuff that's very complex. So for that, that will require a very good, well-curated uh, data sets, which can be used for training. So in a sense, we are working on the entire spectrum at this point of time. And we want to be very rapid adopters. Our country has been quick adapter of technology with the Digital India, as, as all of us know. Have, I mean, we are one of those countries which have digitalized uh, transactions and day-to-day -day living in a very big way. So we would like to take lead in that. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, within OpenAI, we've been uh, launching models and features at a, you know, absolutely incredible speed and, you know, leading to a lot of steep, uh, in, you know, uh, uptake on even adoption uh, within OpenAI. I'm really curious, Sam, when you were here last time, you said, you know, there are some things that India should be doing and we are uniquely placed to contribute. And you know, this is your sort of last stop uh, in the APAC leg of, of the multiple uh, country tour that you're doing. What is it that we can really do which we're not thinking and not doing enough of? I, I really want to echo the comments about the full stack approach. Um, India is an incredibly important market for AI in general, for OpenAI in particular. It's our second biggest market, tripled users here in the last year. Um, but mostly seeing what people in India are building with AI at all levels of the stack, chips, models, uh, you know, all of the incredible applications. So I think India should be doing everything. I think India should be one of the leaders of the AI revolution. It's a, it, it's really quite amazing to see what the country has done and embraced the technology and building, uh, again, the, the entire stack of things on top of it. Yeah, and also with the, you know, recent uh, developments, uh, you know, do you have a different view around the cost of building foundational models? <laughs> yeah. Um, so... First of all, if that's, a, if that's a reference to a comment I made here a few years ago about the cost, uh, I think that was taken out of context. Um, that was a very specific time when there was a certain scaling thing where I thought, you know, it's going to, and I still think to stay on that frontier of pre trained models is expensive. But one of the most exciting things that's happened to me since, that I think has happened in the industry since, is we're now in a world where. Um, we made incredible progress with distillation. We learned a lot how to do small models, and these reasoning models in particular can be, it's not cheap, it's still expensive to train them, but it's doable. Uh, and I think that's gonna lead to an explosion of really great creativity, and you know, India should be a, a leader there, of course. Um, there's, there's two sort of different ways you can look at the costs of models. So to stay at the frontier, um, we believe those costs will continue to rise on this exponential curve, but also the returns to increase in intelligence are exponential in terms of the economic value, the scientific value that you can create. Um, so, you know, we're doing this big Stargate project and that's gonna go like this. On the other side of it, um, the, the cost for a given unit of intelligence one year later seems to fall by about 10x. Moore's Law was a 2x every 18 months for the number of transistors on a chip and that changed the world if you waited a few decades. 
But what's happening with the reduction in cost in AI models is, is extraordinary. Now, I don't think it means that the world's gonna need any less AI hardware because you bring the cost down and just the people are gonna use it for a lot more things. The total number of dollars will go up. But, uh, you know, it, that's, a, that's a really exciting thing happening. Well, that's that's uh, wonderful to hear, and I think there's a lot of excitement here, which is why you know. So I'd like to come to you. You know, we you recently announced that India should be building foundational models, and you know it's a very complex process. And I was just wondering, you know, how are you thinking about you know the the surprises and the serendipity that's going to come from a lot of the uh, diversity that we have here and the complexity of just India. And so you know, how do you feel that? The, f the foundational models that we are, that India is planning to build, uh, is going to be unique and serve a unique purpose uh, to the world. Listen, lots of innovation is happening. As Sam said, every year it's uh, 10x uh, reduction in the cost of intelligence. That kind of innovation can, can come from anywhere in the world. Why shouldn't it come from India? That's the point. Sure. And our uh, young entrepreneurs, our startups, our researchers, they are really, really focused on getting that next level of innovation, which will reduce the cost. See, we were, we, our country sent a mission to the moon at a fraction of the cost that many other countries did, right? Why can't we do a model which will be a fraction of the, which will be a fraction of the cost that many other countries do? So yes, innovation will bring that cost down. We think that that kind of thing will come out in this process. Absolutely, and you know, just the diversity that we have here. I think you know, at OpenAI, often we say that you know, if you can solve uh, for India, often you can solve you know for the world as well. Because if you're able to take care of the 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 breadth that we have and be able to solve for the last mile, uh, often you can you know very much do that. And you know, also you've spoken extensively about the you know the excitement that you have around building on application layers. And you know, and since we have developers and startups in the room, I think this could be a great uh, space or a great platform for you to share what do you really think are you know areas that they should really be thinking about and also not only supporting on the application layer but also your adoption just within the government how are you really looking at that ai adoption within the government that's a good question we have been uh, using multiple ai applications within large i mean uh, so many different departments so many wings of the government um, and uh, i think that that can really help us solve these population scale problems because most of the problems we face, Sam, are problems where you have to look at a multiple of billion, so which is like very common. So then how do we solve these population scale problems? That's where our focus, of course, is on all the three layers and within the applications in healthcare, in education, in agriculture, in weather forecasting, in disaster management, in transportation, multiple different things we are working. And the I uh, request the entire startup community to come up with uh, very unique solutions. And uh, we'll be open. We are very soon starting a kind of open competition for it, open empanelment competition kind of thing. So that will be huge. So many problems can be solved. And why don't we use this latest technology that we have for solving these problems, right? You guys are good with that? Would love to. Love to do. So more yeah. energy, guys. Come on. <laughs> Amazing. Um, you know, just building on that, uh, uh, you know, Sam, I'd like to come to you, talking about population scale problems, as the minister said, you know, again, India is very placed for, very well placed for that. And, and our mission really is, you know, artificial general intelligence for all of humanity. And so I'm really curious to understand from you, how can the models and the tools that we are constantly releasing play that equalizer role and be able to really fulfill in healthcare, education, at, you know, really significant ways? You know, finally, for the first time, I think the models that are on the near-term horizon, um, the models that we'll release in the coming months, are over the threshold of being good enough to really address these problems, and now people just have to go build the solutions. So you already see, and you see this actually a lot with deep research in the last couple of days, people say it did this amazing thing for diagnosing a disease or helping me with my research to you know, try to cure a disease. Um, Education, you've already seen now with previous models where people say that the amazing uh, tutoring results. So I think the underlying innate technology is just right on the threshold, and we'll get there with the next models. But now people have got to go off and build all these services. So someone in this room hopefully will figure out what the AI tutor of the future looks like, and you know that'll be a population scale thing, and it'll think what that would do if every kid on Earth 
you know, this year got uh, got an AI tutor that was provided like a better education or helped to provide a better education than anybody could get last year. Um, think what it would mean if we could have like an AI medical diagnosis system that was better than anyone could get last year. Um, think what it could mean if scientists could go cure every disease faster. And so, you know, we've been waiting for this moment for a long time. Um, I think we're going to deliver something that can help with it, and now people have to go go build with it. Absolutely, and I think the recent uh, launch of uh, the research was just incredible, right? And I think everyone's been tracking it closely. We want to be able to use it. Do you have any advice specifically if we were to use that uh, to solve, you know, very complex problems like cancer and, and large diseases that we that we suffer? Do you have any sort of guidance on what's the right way to start experimenting? So we're, we're very much still in the research assistant phase of this. Um, this can help someone... Uh, you know, review the existing literature and find some connections. But this is not an innovator yet. This is, I, I don't think we're yet at the technological level where any of us should expect these models to go cure cancer on their own. We will get there, I think. Yes. Um, but for now, uh, you, you know, this can just, I think this can help people, help researchers say, be much more productive in what they do. Absolutely. Um, I also just want to ask you, you know, what would, India has an aspiration to have a voice and be in, you know, the top, uh, global countries contributing towards AI. What do you think, what is your advice, you know, as we think about and as we have so on stage, what do you think we should do uh, to really have that global voice that we want to be and leaders actually in India? I mean, it seems to me like it's working. Yeah. I'm not sure you need to do anything differently. <laughs> That's already a compliment to what, what uh, Sir is already doing and, and getting out. Um, I also want to ask you, sir, a quick question. I, you must be using AI in your daily life, and I'm not going to ask you what is your favorite platform because that we already know. Uh, <laughs> so, but I'd love. I'm very curious to know how is uh, OpenAI models adding efficiency and productivity to you in your daily life. Bad question to ask. <laughs> On this platform, obviously, I'll say it's very good. <laughs> no, of course, uh, jokes apart. OpenAI really makes life. Uh, significantly easier. Um, writing notes, getting all that stuff out, it becomes very easy and getting the... I was just curious, what would your research project mean for quite a lot of people and how can we make, the, make that transition smoother? How can we make more difference in their lives as we were discussing just before coming to this stage? As in the um, large number of people who do a little bit of basic research and bring out reports. So, this is a very unscientific guess, but my, my vibes-based guess is that deep research can do a single-digit percentage of all of the economically valuable tasks in the world, and almost none of the complete jobs. Um, but that's okay, because you can just use it to be more efficient. So if you are a scientist trying to cure some disease, deep research is surely not going to go cure that disease on its own. But if you can farm out um, the tasks that took you a lot of time but were lower value, you know, if you can say, help me with this literature review, help me figure out how to order these supplies, help me figure out what steps I need for this experiment, and you learn to work that way, maybe you can be twice as efficient. And if you can double the efficiency of every scientist on Earth with the tool we have today, which I believe might be possible, it's, again, it's not going to do the really brilliant insights, but if it can take away a lot of the lower level work, um, it's going to take the world a while to get used to that. I think you know, people have compared the launch of deep research to the launch of ChatGPT, where so we had chatbots, and now we go to these agents. And you, it's like a magical thing. You're like, oh, I didn't think AI could go do this thing for me. I didn't think I could go do a multi-day task, and now I can. Um, but it took a while for the world to figure out how to use ChatGPT. Not that long, like months, uh, not, not years. And I think it's going to take months, not years, to figure out how people become really productive with deep research. Yeah. Security is another concern, and also there are concerns about national security. Sam, what do you think? How should we be working on these items? He's taking my job now. <laughs> um, I, I think these, yeah, these models are on the precipice of being incredible at software engineering, and that'll be great for a lot of things. I think software engineering by the end of 2025 looks very different than software engineering at the beginning of 2025 does. But it will have huge impacts, good and bad, for cybersecurity. And we've got to get ahead on the good. For sure. 
No, sir, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that guy is saying, time, sir. I just wanted to make the best use of every second that I have with you, Sam. And thanks a lot for coming to India. We are super excited that you